Tilting at windmills and the dumbest bill in America. This is Mark Fisher with Mark and the Millennials. And the millennial joining me today is, of course, our producer, Christopher Hopkins. He's on the other side of the camera. How are you doing, Christopher? I'm good. Well, welcome, everybody, to Mark and the Millennials. We're calling this Tilting at Windmills because, guess what? Beto is back. Beto is back because you have seen, of course, all of the carnage in Texas over all of the wind turbines. Technically, that's, that's what they're called. Uh, and now, of course, you have the left-wing media, MSNBC, CNN, and naturally, they're bringing on Beto because he ran against Ted Cruz for Senate and lost. And of course, he also ran for president of the United States and lost. And they brought Beto back to talk about the issue of the Texas meltdown as it relates to the grid not working properly as a result of a number of different issues. And so what we want to do is we want to bring you all of the different perspectives from the different media outlets to show you how incredibly corrupt they are. Not that you didn't know that already, but it's worth listening to because they're really not interested in solving the problem. It's all about doing what? It's all about trying to turn Texas blue. It's really what it's always about with CNN and MSNBC. So first up, Beto is back. And he's here opining about the issue in Texas, about how all of the wind turbines froze and who is at fault. We have that clip and here it is. We, we the, the energy capital of North America cannot provide the energy needed to warm and power people's homes in, in this great state. We, we are nearing a failed state in Texas and it has nothing to do with God or natural disasters. It has everything to do with the leadership and those in positions of public trust who have failed us. So, of course, that's Beto. It's all about the leadership. So, to be fair, I'm sure that's partly true, right? It's no doubt that people who govern Texas have looked the other way while all of these renewables have gone online and fed power onto the grid. And they've said to themselves, well, you know, we have all this power on the grid, it's renewable, everything's fine. But is it really fine? Well, it's not fine because we see that there has been this incredible breakdown of uh, electricity generation in the state of Texas. And so, but naturally they bring Beto back because Beto is all about, he wants to be governor of Texas or United States Senator from Texas. He wants to be something, he wants to be relevant. And of course, Texas is an energy capital. Um, it's the energy capital of North America, but he calls it a failed state. <laughs> You know, that's Beto. It's a failed state. I mean, you know, everything's falling apart. Uh, we're going to talk about this more. But we also want to show you first up uh, CNN's Brianna Keller talking about Texas. And she's mocking Texas Governor Abbott and saying he's tilting at windmills. We had that clip. And here it is. There are millions of people who are living without power right now in Texas. As we told you, they are cold. Some are even dying. This is a debacle of historic proportions after the severe winter storm knocked out the power grid. So what is the state's governor doing about this in the middle of this crisis? He's tilting at windmills. This shows how the Green New Deal would be a deadly deal for the United States of America. Our wind and our solar got shut down and, and they were uh, collectively more than 10 percent of our power grid. And that thrust Texas into a situation where it was lacking power in a statewide basis. It just shows uh, that fossil fuel is necessary uh, for the state of Texas as well as other states to make sure that we were, uh, will be able to heat our homes in the wintertime and cool our homes in the summertime. So that was, of course, Texas Governor Abbott talking about the issue and Brianna Keller from CNN saying he's tilting at windmills. And of course, the tilting at windmills reference is the English idiom meaning attacking imaginary enemies, uh, based on, of course, Miguel de Cervantes' 17th century novel, Don Quixote. So naturally, what she's talking about is he's, it's all imaginary. The fact that the windmills caused the problem or even remotely contributed to the problem isn't possible, according to CNN. It's the governor who's tilting at windmills. Just demonstrates to you the corruption, of course, the lack of interest in trying to actually solve problems. So here she is again, Sienna, CNN's Brianna Keller, Keller, excuse me, and she says, well, you know, experts say, Look, folks, we have to really, as conservatives, we have to do a much better job at shutting the media down and our opponents down when they say, experts say, experts say, because what? who are the experts? Where did they say it? 
where's the study? But this is what the media does all the time. Listen closely to how she says this. Here's a clip. It's all the windmill's fault, Governor Greg Abbott says, not missing the chance to spin a yarn for political gain in the middle of a crisis. He blames renewable energy for the rolling power outages that have Texans seeking refuge in their cars as the temperatures in their homes drop into the 40s. But he's wrong. Experts say that it is a okay. garden variety of reasons. But in Texas, which predominantly relies on natural gas, solar and wind sources are not even close to being the main factor here. First, Texas operates its own power grid, refusing the help of the federal system, which every other state relies upon, allowing them to more easily borrow power when it's needed, like during a disaster. So there probably really are a lot of contributing factors to why this happened in Texas, but CNN isn't interested in saying or even remotely suggesting that the wind turbines were frozen because everybody saw the pictures on TV, they're frozen solid, right? So she's saying, well, but it's not the wind turbines. And the governor is lying about that. Uh, it's, it's everything else, it's fossil fuels. Of course it's fossil fuels. Why can't they just be honest at CNN and say, well, you know, there are actually a lot of contributing factors but when we look at the wind turbines and we see that they are covered with ice, I mean, the ice was, it looked like it was feet thick around the wind turbines and that they weren't moving, which means they're not generating electricity. When we look at that, we can pretty much conclude that they're not generating any kind of electricity that's being thrown on the grid. And that probably creates a problem if you are relying on those wind turbines. So here she is again, Brianna Keller of CNN, and she quotes the Oracle, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, you know, the Oracle, AOC. She quotes her because AOC tweeted. <laughs> if you're listening, uh, she won't read the tweet, but we will read it for you afterwards. Uh, but if you're watching, you'll be able to see the tweet. We have that clip near it is. Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, one of the architects of the climate legislation, responded, quote, the infrastructure failures in Texas are quite literally what happens when you don't pursue a Green New Deal. And so, AOC, <laughs> excuse me, she says, she tweets, the infrastructure failures in Texas are quite literally what happens when you don't pursue a Green New Deal. That was AOC's tweet. So in other words, let's double and triple down on the Green New Deal and build even more wind turbines in Texas. And let's put more wind turbines on the grid in Texas so that Texas is even more reliant on intermittent power meaning power that only works when there is wind, so will Texas be relying on this so that the next storm that comes, maybe, I don't know, 80% of Texas will be without power instead of just, you know, a lesser percentage, maybe less than, less than 50%. It's just ridiculous. It's just the most ridiculous thing that uh, CNN, that, that the reporters are even talking about this idea, this yeah. idea that... Uh, it's not in any way, shape, or form the wind turbines. Look, we know that there's a grid issue in Texas. We know that natural gas plants had some issues with freezing. And so why did that happen? And we know the wind turbines didn't work at all. So we there are a lot of contributing factors, and I would imagine that there's gonna be an investigation and that Texas will be the better for it. That's what a proper media outlet would do if they really were interested in an in investigative journalism, they would be looking into this and really being on site and showing you pictures of the wind turbines. By the way, CNN and MSNBC, they won't even show the frozen wind turbines. They won't even show it. So it's like it doesn't even exist. <laughs> so proof be told. So Chris Hayes of MSNBC, we have a clip from him and I have to set this up. He actually has, while he's talking on MSNBC, a little like placard behind him that's put up <laughs> and it says, no, it wasn't the windmills. But what he could do is have a picture of the frozen windmills, of course, but, th but they won't show that. Instead, it's almost like this, this, this subliminal message, you know, <laughs> that they're trying to show you that they normally would do in let's say the Soviet Union. No, it wasn't, the, no, it wasn't Chernobyl. It wasn't Chernobyl, it wasn't the meltdown. A meltdown didn't happen. We have that clip from Chris Hayes of MSNBC, and here it is. And the person at the head of the Texas government took the time to go on Fox News last night to push the big lie that Republicans and right-wing media have been pushing for days. A brazen, jaw-dropping lie 
that the hippie libs and their clean energy are to blame for the devastation in Texas. The Green New Deal would be a deadly deal for the United States of America. Texas is blessed with multiple sources of energy, such as uh, natural gas and oil uh, and nuclear, as, as well as uh, solar and wind. Uh, but you saw from what Trace said, uh, and that is our wind and our solar got shut down, and, and they were uh, collectively more than 10 percent of our power grid. And that thrust Texas into a situation where it was lacking power in a statewide basis. If the Biden administration is going to try to eradicate uh, fossil fuels in the United States, Every state is going to constantly have challenges like what America has seen take place in Texas right now. That's not true, just to be clear. The idea that wind and solar completely went out and thrust the state into that situation. So, can you imagine? So, the entire time Chris Hayes is talking, he has that little sign behind him. It says, no, it wasn't the, the windmills. He plays the clip from Governor Abbott, and then he says, Chris Hayes says, that's not true. It's not true that wind turbines and or solar were shut down during this storm. It's not true. Well, all you have to do, ladies and gentlemen, as we said ad nauseum, is look at the pictures and then you can see that it's true. But MSNBC won't even show the pictures. CNN won't even show the pictures. I mean, can you imagine? Instead, what they show are pictures of natural gas power plants. <laughs> I mean, it's so corrupt. So we have Rick Perry, of course, he, look, this guy is an authority, and I have to admit that he actually does a good job talking about the, the overall macroeconomic issue in Texas with respect to the power shutdown. And Rick Perry, of course, is not only the former governor of Texas, but he's the former Secretary of Energy of the United States of America. And I really believe that this guy um, is honest. Uh, he talks about the issue at a more macroeconomic level and what can be done to fix it. And we have that clip and here it is. Uh, we need to have more diversity in our, um, uh, in our portfolio. I think walking away from fossil fuels, walking away from nuclear is an absolute uh, recipe for disaster. So yeah, so walking away from nuclear. So in America, the left doesn't support nuclear. They think nuclear is bad, but it's because of course they keep using Fukushima and Three Mile Island as examples. But the fact of the matter is modern nuclear energy is not only incredibly safe, but it requires less of a footprint and produces enormous amounts of carbon-free, reliable, baseload power. That is to say, power that works no matter what the weather is and power that works no matter if it's windy or no matter if it's sun sunny. And that, of course, is Rick Perry on Fox News talking about the overall issue and and he, he did a great job. If you have a chance, listen to that whole interview because he also talked about there were grid issues. Yes, there were issues at some of the natural gas plants. Yes, it was a really unique storm. Yes, all of the wind turbines were frozen solid. Um, and that it was a failure. It was a failure. And no doubt, it's a failure of government. It's a failure of government policy, as we've talked about so many times before. But I just thought you would enjoy podcast listeners listening to all of those different perspectives, CNN, MSNBC, Fox, and all the different people that they use and try to convince you who's responsible and what is responsible. And we just have a, a real problem, not that this is a surprise, but a real problem in the general media uh, about investigative journalism, but also about just talking about an issue intelligently and getting experts on and getting the different opinions. And wherever those opinions go, wherever the truth goes, let it go in that direction, right? Let's find out how to fix it. How can you fix anything unless you aren't, unless you're willing to look at the different perspectives? And that is Beto is back. So next up, podcast listeners, climate change is about control. You think? I've thought this for a long time. Climate change is about control. And there's no better way of understanding that than if you ever listen to someone from the left say, we only have 10 years to live. Now, I got to tell you something. I don't talk about this often, but as a legislator, I will hear other legislators on the other side of the aisle say just that. And they've been saying this. We only have 10 years to live. They've been saying it for about, I don't know, three or four years but it's still 10 years. We only have 10 years. Well, John, John Kerry, <laughs> he has, uh, he has some, some different views on this. Uh, he's actually counting down the clock and making it sound like it's so catastrophic and biblical 
that the end of time will be here. And so he talks about the stringent policies that must be put into place. Um, look, I just said climate change is about control. That's what this segment is about. And listen closely to what John Kerry is saying. This is what the left believes. And we have that clip, and here it is. But we know from the measurements, from the statistics, from the science, that emissions globally rose over the years since Paris. 2020 saw a drop in global emissions due to COVID, but already they're again on the rise. And many analysts expect a very quick rebound to where we were, rising even more, unless very stringent policies are put in place. Ah, unless, unless very stringent policies are put in place. Many analysts say, who are the analysts? Experts say, same old crap, right? It's the same old, you know, scare tactics. Experts say that they never, of course, bring these people forward. And of course, a good network would actually do that, right? I think that was NBC. A good network would actually say, well, let's bring some experts. Let's bring experts from both sides of the issue, and let's listen to what they say to find out if we need to put lots of new stringent policies in place, as John Kerry says. What the heck does that mean, stringent policies? And we'll talk about that in a minute, but first up, we have another clip from good old John Kerry, and he says, there's an even greater sense of urgency because we need to stop rising temperatures. According to John Kerry, we can do that. We had that clip. And here it is. So to be on track to keep even a 66% probability of keeping global temperatures from rising more than 1.5 degrees, to do that, we need to cut global emissions in half by 2030. So that means we need to phase out coal five times faster than we have been. We need to increase tree cover five times faster. We need to ramp up renewable energy six times faster. We need to transition to electric vehicles at a rate 22 times faster. You get the drift? Everything has to be done with greater sense of urgency, with the determination that we have to win this, this fight. This guy is so arrogant. You get the drift? You get the drift? In other words, every aspect of life will change if we give government the power to do this under the guise of climate change because climate change is really about control. And it's about scaring the heck out of people and convincing them that their lives will, I don't know, be ending soon. And that's, we had that clip too, because here's John Kerry saying just that. It's the end of time. It's the end of time. Imagine if you are someone who, I don't know, really doesn't have any kind of deep faith in anything and you take on the climate change issue as kind of your faith, kind of like your religion, and you believe it, um, but you believe it just because you hear it again and again without any kind of true counterbalance or counter story from different experts, and you only read one journal, and you only watch MSNBC, or you only watch John Kerry, or you only watch Joe Biden or AOC, nonetheless, Here's John Kerry talking about the end of time. Here it is. We are absolutely clearly, without question, now inside the decisive decade. Hundreds of millions of people will be forced from their homes, forced from their habitat. <laughs> so hundreds of millions of people, according to John Kerry, will be forced from their homes and forced from their habitat. He actually believes this, okay? Uh, so we're talking about is climate change and climate change is completely about control. Let's talk about another thing that they're trying to control using climate change as the argument. Bill Gates says rich countries should be eating 100% synthetic beef. Bill Gates says rich countries should be eating 100% synthetic beef. Here's the story. Bill Gates is arguing that the world's wealthiest countries should ditch beef for plant-based alternatives to fight global climate change <laughs> in a recent interview with MIT Technology Review. <laughs> yes, so you wonder what your kids are learning in college. While he explained the 80%, 80 poorest countries still must rely on real meat consumption, the Microsoft co-founder says the future should be plant-based for developed countries. 
I do think all rich countries should move to 100% synthetic beef. You can get used to the taste difference, and the claim is they're going to make it taste even better over time, said Gates. Eventually, that green premium is modest enough that you can sort of change the behavior of people or use regulation, <laughs> use regulation to totally shift the demand, the Microsoft co-founder told the MIT Tech Review. So climate change is really all about control, but not just control of the things that we thought they wanted to control, like what kind of power you get to use, but now it's what you can eat. It's now what you can farm. It's now where you live. Ladies and gentlemen, I gotta tell you, if this doesn't scare the living hell out of you, I don't know what will. And of course, you have the one side of the fence with you know the John Kerry's of the world that are trying to scare the heck out of people on the left that they're going to die now in nine years. At least John Kerry is counting down, right? Because two years ago he said 10 years, but now it's nine years. I guess really it should be eight. Uh, and then on the other side, uh, you have folks who really aren't watching this issue of climate change and understanding what the left is really trying to do to their lifestyles. And what the left is really trying to do is to herd them into an area and have them live in who knows what kind of, I mean, I can't even figure it out. I mean, you're supposed to live only where they tell you to live? Yes, apparently so. You're supposed to eat only what they are telling you to eat? Yes, apparently so. And of course, as you might imagine, Bill Gates, what is he doing? He's investing in some of these companies that make these synthetic meat products. He's investing in massive amounts of farmland. I mean, look, we have to look, we have to look at what is motivating the climate change people. I believe it's all about money. I'm not gonna sit here and say that there aren't areas of the country where the water level is rising, because of course we know that it is. I'm not gonna sit here and say that there aren't storms that do seem extreme. I do believe they are. But do we believe that as a result of those things that are happening, that we should allow the left to completely control every aspect of human life, where we live and what we eat, and what kind of car we get to drive, and whether we get to be on airplanes, and whether we get to go on vacations, and where we get to go, and whether we have freedom of movement. We really have to ask ourselves that question, because as soon as we cede the, the high ground on the climate change issue, we're ceding all of our personal freedoms. And that's really something we have to look closely at. And that is, climate change is about control. So get this podcast, listeners. There are commissioners in Brevard County, Florida. These are the elected officials. These are the local elected officials. They're called county commissioners in Brevard County, Florida. And those county commissioners decided to really kind of punk a journalist, if you will. <laughs> I'm not really sure what else you would call it. Uh, so <laughs> The Hill has reported, and we have some clips on this too, so it's really funny. The Hill has reported, Florida County officials pass a resolution mocking a columnist. And so here's what happened. Officials in Brevard County, Florida, passed a resolution last week offering sarcastic praise for a former Florida Today columnist who recently got a new job at the Miami Herald. The five Brevard County commissioners approved the resolution that they said was honoring the columnist whose name is Isadora Rangel. During a February 9th meeting after she departed her role as the engagement editor and opinion writer for Florida Today's editorial board. So she works at Florida Today. It's a newspaper. Um, and I, I'm not sure if it's a TV station as well, but I believe it's a newspaper. And she's been working there for some time and she, all she has been doing is trashing the Brevard County Commissioners. Why? Because they are Republicans. And she, Isadora Rangel, is actually from Brazil. And she is here legally as um, a, uh, as she's not a citizen, but she actually is here legally, I guess, working for the paper. Not really sure what the terminology is, but let's put it this way. She's a Brazilian citizen, not an American citizen. Why she's working for these newspapers, I don't know, I mean, 
I, <laughs> that's a whole nother issue. And I think that that has really tweaked the Brevard County commissioners that you have this person who can't even vote in the United States, let alone in their county. And she's working for Florida Today and all she has spent her time doing is criticizing these commissioners no matter what. And it's all, all of it is very, very much, of course, partisan. And so to prove it, let me read some of her tweets. So here's Isadora Rangel's tweets. And one vote by a mail bill is already moving in the Senate and would make it more cumbersome for people to vote by mail. Uh, here's another one. He has to take care of his light, which comes from the inside. I'm not sure what she was talking about there. But here's one on DeSantis that she wrote. So what DeSantis is saying is that county commissioners should bite their tongue when two rich zip codes that are least affected by COVID-19 get v v VIP access to vaccines. So you can kind of get a flavor just from those few that I've read that this person is a partisan hack and the Florida commissioners have commemorated that hack journalist. And why have they done that? Well, because they're very upset with her corrupt reporting and the fact that I think that she's really not, she's really not a, a citizen in the United States. She's just a legal resident. So John Tobia is a Brevard County commissioner. <laughs> All right. He's an elected county commissioner of Brevard County. And I think I'm saying that correct. It's either Brevard or Brevard. I'm not really sure. Or Brevard. So he's an elected county commissioner there. And he decides to put forth a resolution in the regular county commissioner meeting where they have five elected county commissioners in the county. He reads the resolution out loud. And its purpose is to mock Isadora Rangel. <laughs> We have a series of clips on this, and here it is. Whereas Ms. Rangel oversaw the Florida Today's opinion page, wrote columns and editorials, as well as coordinated engagement efforts in Brevard County, including the Project Civility Brevard. And whereas because of her ELCA prose, the circulation of the Florida Today dropped only 16% during her tenure, according to Dan Christensen of the Florida Bulldog. And whereas she selflessly advocated for public notice in newspapers to fight despite the fact that it's rarely read, costs taxpayers millions, and would benefit her employer's pocketbooks. And whereas her dedication to Brevard is exemplified by accepting a, a position with the Miami Herald a mere three years after coming here, and whereas her liberal viewpoints will be sorely missed by Brevard Democrats alike. Now, therefore, it be resolved that the Brevard County Commission wishes Isadora uh, Rangel much success in future endeavors done, ordered, and adopted in this regular session, the ninth day of February 2021. Make like to make a motion, Madam Chair, to uh, approve this resolution. Can I have a motion? Can I have a second? Second, second by Commissioner Zonka. I'm going to go ahead and do a vote, and I'll call you, sir. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. Passes 5-0. Commissioner Lober. <laughs> so that resolution passed 5-0, and that was Commissioner John Tobio who read it. And I'm not sure if you caught it, but he said, during Isabel Rangel's uh, duration, if you will, during her work period at Florida Today, Florida T Today's circulation dropped by 16%. So 16% fewer people are receiving the paper or reading the paper. So it's a failing of course, news outlet, as so many of them are, for obvious reasons, because they are so corrupt. No one wants to read a corrupt newspaper anymore. But there's something else that John Tobiah, the commissioner, also mentioned, and that is Isadora Rangel, she was advocating at that county commissioner uh, meeting, uh, not, well, let's put it this way. She was at the county commissioner meetings previously, Isadora Rangel was, and she was there for the purpose of trying to force them to require the county to advertise public notices. So for example, about property foreclosures uh, as a result of not paying your property taxes or about unclaimed uh, property, you name it, right? There are lots of things that counties are required to publish, but increasingly counties are publishing them where? They're publishing them on the county's website. But Isadora Rangel wants to force the commissioners to publish it in Florida today, because why? They would have to pay the newspaper, and the newspaper, of course, is losing revenue left and right, and so she's upset about that, so she's attacked them about that as well. So John Tobia, the commissioner from Brevard County, totally called her out on that. So then, if that isn't enough, 
Commission Brian Loeber, who's also from the same county and also a Republican, says, wait a minute, I want to amend that, I want to, I want to amend that resolution. And the reason I want to amend the resolution is because I want to make it even, even stronger and funnier. <laughs> so apparently, these guys really dislike this particular journalist. So we had that clip, and here it is. Whereas throughout her employment with Florida Today, Ms. Rangel never once let the fact she's forbidden from voting in this county deter her from commenting on our politics and criticizing numerous Republican elected officials. That's my first one. I don't know if you'd be okay with that, Commissioner. I'm... I'm if, if it's okay with the board, I'm happy to uh, accept it. I certainly don't. I certainly wouldn't want to uh, sabotage it with with a certain whereas clause. But if, if there's two other, if there's one, one other member, I'm okay. Okay. Well, we'll see. I, that's was the that one the I really more, want, Madam Chair. Yes, sir. Was that the more palatable one? That was the more palatable. <laughs> Buckle up, Madam Chair. <laughs> All right. I'll, I'll take my uh, my mask off. I've got a good ten feet from Commissioner Kabai here, so I. I pronounce everything correctly Takes and, his mask off. and well understood. Whereas despite her recurring and highly partisan criticisms of the manner in which this county, state, and country are governed, Ms. Rangel deserves recognition for selflessly remaining in this country, notwithstanding our roughly tenfold higher per capita GDP and approximately one-sixth the murder rate of the country from which she hails. <laughs> so Isabella Rangel, of course, is from Brazil, and that is Commissioner Brian Loeber saying, yeah, you know, it's funny, she's criticizing people in the United States, specifically this particular commission, and she's criticizing, criticizing them. She's not an American citizen. And if she were home, she has a much higher death rate there as a result of uh, the murders that occur in Brazil, especially in the favelas. And in addition to that, of course, their economy there is not doing so well, and their standard of living isn't even close to that in the United States. But Florida Today nonetheless hires her because you know she's an expert on what's right and what's correct in the United States? Hysterical. So John Tobia, the commissioner who originally did the resolution, <laughs> makes a motion to amend Brian Loeber's new, new resolution onto his. And this is the final clip of this segment. Here it is. So I'd like to amend the motion with the additional whereas clause that says, quote, Throughout her employment with Florida today, Ms. Rangel never once let the fact that she's forbidden from voting in this county deter her from commenting on our politics and criticizing numerous Republican elected officials. That would be the motion, Madam Chair. Second hold. Did I second it? Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay, second holds. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes 5-0. That will be hanging on nobody's wall, I'm sure. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> Thank can you, I, sir. Can I take an extra 20-something dollars in to get a copy from my office as well? I really want that on my wall. <laughs> so that was, that was Brian Loeber, uh, I believe. And he's like, can I, um, you know, can I frame that? Is that okay? And, and uh, you know, spend $20 from my account here at, as a county commissioner and frame that? Because I want, I want that on my wall. <laughs> So, <laughs> so that's really good. Look, I'm sure that some po podcast listeners are saying, well, that's not what politicians are supposed to be doing. But you know what? Sometimes you have to do humorous things, and as, especially as a Republican. And it's, it's a good thing. It's a good thing to call out the media, especially when the corrupt and failing print media, like Florida Today and the Miami Herald, when, when that print media is hiring people that aren't even American citizens, and their sole modus operandi is to criticize all that is America and all that is conservative and saying that that's bad without having any kind of, you know, balance, of course. And so good for these Florida commissioners for, for doing this resolution. I, I know it was probably a waste of time, but, and it doesn't really accomplish anything, but what it does do is it holds the media accountable and, and really kind of undermines the credibility of the media when you have corrupt, corrupted media journalists like Isadora Rangel. And I think that that's, there's a lot of positive that can come out of calling people out. If more politicians did that, I think media outlets would probably be less likely to hire people who would be opinionated, but only on the one side of the fence. And that is Florida commissioners commemorate Hack journalists. So get this podcast, listeners. Do you know about regulatory capture? So Walmart is now 
advancing a $15 minimum wage nationwide, not just at Walmart. Walmart likes Biden's plan for a $15 minimum wage. Now, if you are a reader of the Wall Street Journal and you were to look at this particular article, you would say to yourself, well, that's great. Walmart's paying people more. Look, first of all, that is great. That is great. But why is Walmart not just paying people more, but at the same time advocating for a national $15 minimum wage where every state and every company inside of every state would have to pay this wage no matter the size of the company and no matter what state they're in and no matter the cost of living in that state. Hmm, let's think about that. Well, it's called regulatory capture. What is regulatory capture? Regulatory capture is when a very large corporation or it could be a medium-sized company in some rare cases, it could be very connected small companies. They use, the, they use the law and they use their access to politicians to change the law so as to benefit just their company. And in this particular case, Walmart naturally would benefit from a $15 minimum wage because a lot of their competitors would go out of business. Walmart was considered essential across the country it was. Walmart was open during the pandemic, while small stores selling much of the same stuff were closed. And so Walmart has already crushed their competition as a result of the pandemic and as a result of dumb government policy. And now the Biden administration wants to implement a $15 national minimum wage. And Walmart's like, yeah, we like that idea. In fact, let's make sure that we don't just pay that to our employees, which is obviously the good side of it, but in addition, Walmart, we want to make sure that everybody has to pay this and we can run our opponents out of business who clearly don't have the size and scale to be able to afford to pay people a $15 minimum wage. And so we have this article in the Wall Street Journal. I just want to read some of it because it really goes to the issue of regulatory capture. What Walmart raises mean for President Biden's $15 minimum wage plan? And it says as follows, Walmart's pledge to lift its average hourly wage above $15 comes in the middle of a Washington debate on whether to more than double the federal minimum wage. The big box retailer's goal is politically significant because it aligns with President Biden's proposal to raise the federal minimum wage to $15 an hour from $7.25 an hour that has been in place for 11 years. It also comes from the nation's largest private employer with stores located in different labor markets across the country. But Walmart's announcement Thursday isn't an endorsement of Mr. Biden's plan. Of course it's, of course it's an endorsement, which is part of a $1.9 trillion COVID-19 relief proposal by Democrats in Congress expected to pass the House later this month. The company supports a higher federal minimum wage, but not $15 an hour. While it plans to raise pay for 425,000 hourly workers from an average above $14 an hour in January 2020, its minimum starting wage would remain at $11 an hour. So the article goes on and then basically explains the fact that, well, Walmart is paying more and they want everybody else to pay more too. And this goes to regulatory capture, ladies and gentlemen, because if you are Walmart, you can buy massive quantities of products that you put in your store because you have thousands of stores. You can buy hundreds of thousands of individual items. You can negotiate much lower prices when you purchase those items from the manufacturer. You can put them in the Walmart store. You can sell them at a lower price. You can run your competitors out of business. You were considered essential in 2020, whereas your competitors were not, were not considered essential. And now, of course, all you have to do is pay $15 minimum wage on average to your employees and advocate at the federal level, even though you're lying about the fact that you're not advocating for it, advocating for it at the federal level that, hey, everybody should be able to do this too. Everybody should be able to afford this. And of course, this is so dangerous because it shows not just the concentration of power in corporate America, but also it shows the fact that corporate America is so connected to the Democrat party that, that they use regulatory capture to run their opponents out of business. 
And that, ladies and gentlemen, is so wrong. I'm going to see a lot more of it under the Biden administration because the Democrats are all about the big corporations and buying them off so that way they get donations from them. And they're all about crushing the small businesses and the medium-sized businesses. And they don't even understand the impact of what they're doing. I mean, Walmart has already had a just devastating effect on Main Street, of course, over the past 30 years. And if that isn't enough, then we have a pandemic. That is a devastating impact on Main Street. I mean, probably even more so than what Walmart did in the past 30 years. Just the, this one year did so much damage. And now Main Street's being told, well, the Democrats want you to pay $15 minimum wage to all of your employees because you know what? We know you've been shut down, but that's too bad. We still want you to pay $15 and that's just the way it's going to be. And that is Walmart wants a $15 regulatory capture. So next up, podcast listeners, we have the dumbest bill in America. And do we have a lead up, Mr. Assistant Producer? Yes, we do. And it's the dumbest bill in America. And that is the No Glory for Hate Act. <laughs> That's right. It's the No Glory for Hate Act. H.R. 484 by Congressman Linda Sanchez of California. So Congressman Linda Sanchez of California has introduced the No Glory for Hate Act, H.R. 484, and guess what it does? Ha <laughs> ha! It says presidents who are twice impeached can't be buried at Arlington National Cemetery or receive federal funding or lots of other post office perks. So here's what the article reads, ABC News 4. House Democrats have introduced a bill that would prohibit the use of federal funds for commemoration of certain former presidents and for other purposes. Under House Bill 484, introduced by Democrat Representative Andre Carson of Indiana in late January, but also the primary sponsor is Linda Sanchez of California, uh, they cannot, let's see what it says here. It says, a federal funds would not be allowed to be used to create or display any symbol, monument, or statue commemorating any former president that has been twice impeached by the House of Representatives on or before the date of the enactment of this act or has been convicted of a state or federal crime relating to actions taken in an official capacity as president of the United States on federal public land, including any highway, park, subway, federal building, military installation, street, or other federal property. In other words, presidents of the United States, when they leave office, are given a budget and the budget allows them to have not just security, but also to do other creative things to restore uh, many of the documents that they had while they were president and to uh, file those documents away and do lots of good things, right? Maybe even commemorate them in some way with a statue, lots of, lots of different things they can do to, commemor to commemorate their particular presidency as they so choose. But the No Glory for Hate Act is saying that President Trump can't do that because he is a twice impeached president and it would take that money away. So we have a number of clips from good old Linda Sanchez of California, the congressman from California that introduced the No Glory for Hate Act. And first up, here she is in 2019 talking about, you know, Christmas time and how wonderful things are. And just to give you a flavor of who she really is. Here's that clip. Hi, everyone. It's been a very productive year in the House this year. We've passed almost 400 bills this year to do things like lower drug prices, protect dreamers and give them a path to citizenship, um, give workers in this country that make minimum wage a raise, just to name a few things. Um, I'm getting ready to head back to California to finish up my holiday shopping and to spend some time with friends and family. So classic Democrat, right? We've passed 400 bills. That's, of course, how they are judged, right? That's one of the reasons, ladies and gentlemen, we do the dumbest bill in America, because we think there are too many bills that are trying to control too much of your life and micromanage too many things in your life. She's proud of it. We already passed 400 bills. And that was in 2019, of course, that she did that little clip. So here is MSNBC uh, talking to Linda Sanchez about her, her, her time on Capitol Hill when the 
insurrection took place on January 6th. And notice that if you're not watching, she's wearing a mask while she's being interviewed. And of course, there's nobody around. It's just a camera. And the cameraman is probably like 10 feet away. And, but she keeps the mask on when she's, it's just classic Democrat. And she's talking about the insurrectionists during January 6th and how afraid she was. I mean, she's so fearful for her life. I don't doubt that that's the truth, okay? But this is, a lot of this is theater, okay? Because I, I haven't seen any reports that she was in any imminent danger that day whatsoever. But according to her, she was. Listen to the clip, here it is. Um, but any way you look at it, it is frightening. It is tense having to work with people that you feel like don't want to acknowledge what happened or denounce it in any way. Um, and you know, as I laid, as you know, huddled in my office in the dark with a baseball bat in my hand and the door barricaded, you know, waiting to see if these, you know, rioters and, and uh, you know, secessionists and, 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 you know, insurrectionists would reach me. <laughs> so that's, I mean, the drama, right? I mean, the insurrectionists were, were going to, you know, they're going to come get me and reach me. Folks, uh, they weren't even close to her. There were no reports that they were ever close to her. Obviously, no one wants to see her get hurt. The, uh, and that includes me. No one wants to see anyone get hurt. But nonetheless, she's using this drama to, of course, justify her bill, the No Glory for Hate Act. So here she is again, and she's being interviewed by CNN's Nicole Wallace talking about the act itself. This is just a short clip. And here it is. I thought to myself, there is no way that our president should get any glory for inciting hate and insurrection. Um, and as I sat there, I vowed that I would introduce a bill, and I, I have, that would prohibit anything that has an, a penny of federal money, money um, in it from being named after him. And it would also strip him of all of the benefits and honors that uh, former presidents get. So he would not get a travel budget or a staff budget or a pension yeah. um, because you cannot be a traitor to democracy and this country and profit from it, in my view. And the White House has said that they're reviewing whether or not he should um, still receive any sort of even limited intelligence briefings. So he is certainly leaving office in a way that no one else has. Congresswoman Linda Sanchez, you've added so much to our understanding of the events of that day. We're really grateful to you. Thank you. <laughs> so, yeah, it was CNN's Nicole Wallace at the end. He's certainly leaving office like no one else has left office before. In other words, endorsing in her own way, classic CNN, the No Glory for Hate Act. And, and this is the classic cancel culture, right? We don't like the guy. We never liked the guy. We impeached him not once, but we impeached him twice, uh, both times for things that he, he was not responsible for. Uh, and you can disagree with me, and that is fine. Uh, but I don't think he should have been impeached either time. And they tried to cancel him twice already. And now here is the third time. Now we're going to cancel him as an ex-president. We tried to cancel him as a president, but now we're going to cancel him as an ex-president because we want all things wiped out that have Donald Trump's name on it. No statues, no library, no pension, no travel budget, no federal money, no nothing. He must be erased from history. And that is the classic Democrat strategy, right? And it really shows you that they're not listening to the 74 million Americans that voted for this guy. And if they did, they would probably get the fact that, you know, you may want to get off the uh, anti-Trump -Trump train. I'm not saying that you should get on it, but you may just want to move forward and try to start governing and try to start being rational again instead of trying to cancel people that you don't like. This is dangerous stuff. Never seems to end. And uh, it's also the drama part that I wanted the podcast listeners to really kind of focus on of Linda Sanchez. You know, it was all about her. Everybody was coming after her. No, they weren't. No, they weren't. No, they weren't. I mean, most of those people, of course, not all, but most of those people obviously had lost their minds, right? They had no business breaking into the Capitol. They should never have done it. But I don't really think they were after Linda Sanchez. I really don't. I, I mean, because all these individuals were, of course, uh, hurried out through the tunnels and so forth. 
and were taken to secure areas very quickly, including Linda Sanchez herself. And that is the dumbest bill in America. No glory for Haydack. And that's it for Mark and the Millennials. This is Mark Fisher. I want to thank our producer, Christopher Hopkins. Check us out on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Parlor. One day when it comes back soon. Rumble and our website. See you next time. 